Good evening. I'm Roger Juan Maldonado, president of the New York City Bar Association, and I welcome. Um, and a former chair uh, of the task force of the City Bar Association's task force on Puerto Rico. So I'm extremely pleased to welcome you all tonight and thank you for making it out on a truly miserable day, I'm sorry for the conditions, uh, to, uh, to tonight's program, which is entitled uh, Promesa, Two Years Out, Are We Closer to a Solution? Um, I want to start by thanking uh, the sponsors for tonight's program, Ancora, Ask LLP, Beacon Hill Legal, Blank Rome, and King and Spaulding. Uh, tonight's program is organized by the City Bar's Task Force on Puerto Rico. Um, the task force was created in 2016 by my immediate predecessor as president, uh, John Kiernan. And John Kiernan created the task force in response to the U.S. Congress's enactment of PROMESA and the establishment of the Oversight Board and the original focus of the, of the task force was on analyzing the you know, then 10 year uh, continued fiscal crisis in Puerto Rico and the role that the oversight board and the PROMESA legislation would have with respect to that fiscal crisis. In, and in that regard, we uh, communicated with uh, the, the oversight board, urging it to take its time to properly take into account uh, all of the input from all the stakeholders involved, including all of the residents of Puerto Rico, which are the ones who would be primarily impacted by the work of the Oversight Board. Uh, unfortunately, after her, you know, Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico in September of 2017, the task force uh, shifted its focus not to forget about the Oversight Board, but also then to really focus on what was needed to rebuild Puerto Rico. And as uh, part of our efforts in terms of what needed to be done, we urged different entities of the United States government to take certain actions. You know, we urged FEMA to extend the time for Puerto Rico residents to be able to apply for and obtain FEMA benefits. We urged the extension of the time to bring appeals for denials of such benefits. We urged uh, uh, HUD to extend the time for uh, the moratorium on foreclosures of federally insured housing in Puerto Rico. And we urged, um, as authored by James Ostashevsky, who's sitting here in the audience, a report that recommended that Congress enact legislation to exempt Puerto Rico from the requirements of the Jones Act, which operates to increase the cost of goods shipped to Puerto Rico at a time after Hurricane Maria where Puerto Rico could ill afford additional costs. Um, tonight's program will have speakers who I'm about to introduce who are going to focus on the humanitarian and fiscal crises that current, continue to exist in Puerto Rico and the role of PROMESA and the Oversight Board regarding those crises. Um, I will introduce first our moderator for the program, uh, Justice Liana Fiol Mata. Um, you, there are complete bios of all of the uh, panel members and of the moderator in back, so I'm just going to give you a short synopsis to have some ideas to you know who, who, who you will be hearing from tonight. Justice Fiol uh, served as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Puerto Rico from 2014 through 2016. She had previously served 10 years as an Associate Justice on that court. For 12 years before that, she was a judge on Puerto Rico's Court of Appeals. And unlike uh, Court of Appeals in Puerto Rico, is not the same as the Court of Appeals here. It is the second level Court of Appeals. Uh, Justice Fiol currently uh, serves as a professor at the Pont Pontifical Catholic University of Puerto Rico School of Law. Uh, and there's much more that I could say about her and the other panel members, but we need to get to the program. We also have with us Judge Arthur Gonzalez, who is a senior fellow at New York University School of Law and a member of the PROMESA Oversight Board. Judge Gonzalez served as a judge in the United States Bankruptcy Court for the Southern District of New York from 1995 through 2012. Before uh, taking, taking the bench, Judge Gonzalez was the United States trustee for the Second Circuit 
and also served as a teacher in our New York City school system for many years. Um, we have also with us uh, Alvin Velasquez, who is an associate general counsel to the Service Employees International Union. The union is the chair of the official unsecured creditors committee in the PROMESA Title III case, and Mr. Velasquez is the union's representative on the committee. He is here, though, to speak as himself, and not on behalf of the committee. Uh, before joining uh, SEIU, Mr. Velasquez was executive director for Puerto Rico's official committee on the audit of the public debt. We also have with us Luis Jose Torres Asensio, over on my right, who is an adjunct professor of law at the Inter-American University of Puerto Rico, where he teaches classes on constitutional law, environmental law, and procedural law. Mr. Torres Asensio also teaches at the University of Puerto Rico Graduate School of Planning. Mr. Torres Asensio is also a practicing lawyer handling civil and administrative appeals. And finally, we have our, the City Bar Association's own, Natasha Alicia Orabanan. Uh, Natasha is uh, the Associate Counsel at Latino Justice Pearl Def. Her work focuses on the economic uh, exploitation of and discrimination against low-wage Latina and Latino immigrant workers. She also focuses as well on legal support in the face of the um, economic and humanitarian crises that are f affecting Puerto Rico. Natasha previously worked at the Center for Reproductive Rights, and she currently serves as a co-chair of the City Bar Association's Task Force on Puerto Rico. And with that, I leave you with Justice Fiol. Please enjoy the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Maldonado. Thank you all for being here. Such a, at least for me, difficult weather. Uh, I don't know if you are used to it, but I certainly am not. Thank you to all the members of the panel also for uh, answering the Bar Association's call for a meeting to learn more about what's going on in Puerto Rico uh, uh, as a result of its economic situation. Now, PROMESA, the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stabilization Act, that's PROMESA, no? was approved in 2016. You all know that. And uh, I think none of the issues that have arisen uh, since uh, were unexpected. From its inception, uh, it was clear that there would be um, issues concerning the validity of certain debt emissions, given the provisions in the Puerto Rico constitutional the Puerto Rico Constitution that limit the amount of uh, the debt service. Um, and the board filed its objection to uh, debt emissions from 2012 to 2014, precisely just a couple of weeks ago, on January 14th. Uh, rather all issues after March 2012. Uh, so that was not unexpected. And, the, and the, uh, the reason was this anticipated violation of the debt service limit. Uh, related issues, everybody expected them. Would the guaranteed obligations for which there are no independent sources of payment be classified as general obligations of the Commonwealth? Well, that's one of the arguments that the board has uh, for asking uh, uh, that the debt emissions that I have just mentioned be voided. Uh, there were other very anticipatable uh, issues which creditors have valid liens to, uh, to safeguard their investments. That was uh, studied under uh, a, a, uh, an objection to the security liens on the retirement funds, Puerto Rico employees' retirement funds, recently decided by the Circuit Court of Appeals for the First Circuit, which revoked the district court. The district court had found that certain liens on PR 
retirement funds weren't perfected, the circuit court uh, revoked that. And the interesting, another interesting thing in this case was that part of the issue was something that's related to the relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States, which is it, there was a conflict in the language between the Spanish and the English versions of the uh, statute. Another issue that was foreseen from the beginning was who owns the future collections of the island sales tax, the EVU revenues that guarantee payments of more than $17 billion in bonds issued through COFINA, a public corporation that was created in 2006. We got the COFINA case. It was uh, approved, the, the, the settlement proposed by the oversight board uh, and the Commonwealth uh, and COFINA was approved just recently. Again, this was real recent. This was on February 4th. Uh, this settlement was supposed by un the Unsecured Creditors Committee and by a section of the legislature, the popular party legislators, who said that there had been, it was a case of legislative entrenchment in as much as the law that gave us the basis for this, for this settlement, or that makes the settlement possible, ties their hands for a period of 40 years. Um, and that got nowhere. Uh, the, the settlement was uh, approved. Interestingly, Judge Swain, uh, in her order, recognized that the settlement raises serious concerns about the Commonwealth, and I'm citing, future ability to provide for the citizens who depend on it. But that was not within the court's purview. She said, my only, she said, my only, um, purview right here is to see if the settlement is reasonable for the, all the parties that are before the court. And she ruled, of course, that it was for both the creditors and the Commonwealth. Pending questions. Uh, our panelists, I'm sure, will, will talk in more detail about many of these, not necessarily all. It's a lot of material to cover. But for instance, will the board move against somebody as a result of the Cover and Kim report it commissioned on the causes of the debt situation. People are wondering about that. What will happen to public employee pensions? Uh, there's more than 160,000 employee uh, pensioners uh, of the public, retirement, the public uh, employees retirement fund uh, in Puerto Rico. And many of these teachers, police, judges do not receive social security. Uh, the reliance on the private sector to provide essential services and sort of jumpstart the economy, that view that, that that's the way to go, has many people uh, wondering whether it's not more of a, an opportunity for further profit by the pri private sector instead of bettering uh, services essential services. Uh, the reliance on limiting workers' rights, uh, vacation, uh, sick leaves, et cetera, as a way of uh, sort of bolstering economic development. Many people do not agree with this, uh, not just as a humanitarian problem, but also as a strategy for economic stabilization. The cost of maintaining the board, 60 million the first year, and they have asked for a, they asked for a, a, a bigger budget. There are hundreds of contracts for uh, consulting, both legal, economic, financial. The Commonwealth has its lawyers and its economic and financial consultants. The cost is enormous. The Commonwealth pays for, the, for all of this. Uh, when approval was being considered, the Congressional Budget Office estimated the board's expenses for a 10-year period at around $370 million, but it, uh, so far, from what we've seen so far, it will probably be much more than that. Access to information has been an issue from the start. The Center for Investigative Journalism, the Centro de Periodismo Investigativo, won a case in district court to obtain information from the financial agency, uh, financial advisory authority and fiscal agency. And there are other uh, 
groups in Puerto Rico asking for access to information, espacios abiertos, the Comisión Ciudadana para Auditoría e Integral del Crédito Público, et cetera. So that's uh, uh, something that's really uh, very important and is getting a lot of attention. Uh, the relationship between the board and the local governments seems to be a constant source of friction. Uh, the board's fiscal plan requirements uh, and its amendments have met with resistance from the, both the governor and the legislature. There is currently an issue with the board's access to the government's financial information, financial uh, systems and, and databases. Uh, and now the White House has announced that we will have or it intends for us to have a new federal officer to manage the reconstruction process and the federal funds assigned for that purpose um, after the damage due to the hurricanes Irma and Maria. So uh, though this has nothing strictly you know, to do with, with the board or with PROMESA, it's sort of like the straw that's about to break the camel's back. Um, recently, the board uh, informed the governor that it was voiding uh, uh, regulations issued by the patient's advocate because the, they had not been submitted previously to the board and it said that uh, it would take actions, such actions as were necessary, including, including uh, preventing the enforcement of the, of the uh, regulations. Now the feeling in the general public is that things are happening which they cannot really understand, much less control, that will affect their lives, their children, and their grandchildren for many years. Uh, and that, in, in my opinion, in my opinion, brings us back to square one. The basic issue highlighted by Puerto Rico's financial situation and by the solution offered by PROMESA, according to many on different sides of the political or ideological aisle in Puerto Rico, is the relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States. Based as it is on the practically unfettered powers of Congress over the United States territories, thanks not only to the territorial clause of the United States Constitution, but to the Supreme Court, which decided the infamous insular cases at the beginning of the last century. And unfortunately, and very recently, uh, reaffirmed the doctrine elaborated by those cases of the un unincorporated territories in the 2016 cases of Pueblo versus Sanchez Valle, and Pueblo versus uh, PR versus Franklin, California. Uh, so it's a very complicated situation. Uh, it involves not just finance, economics, lawyer, uh, lawyers and others' compensation, uh, the rights of workers, uh, the future economic civilization of Puerto Rico. It involves uh, the very essence of what is Puerto Rico. I don't, I don't have the answers, of course. I, I have the very great job of just being a moderator. I don't have to give answers. I just have to introduce the, the members of the panel who I hope and who we expect to at least give us some ideas of what could be possible answers to all these situations. And so we begin, we begin. I'm gonna ask Judge Gonzalez to start us off. Judge right. Gonzalez. Thank you very much. It's a, an honor to be here tonight before all of you. I was asked to start with a little bit of the history of the board. The board was created under PROMESA and enacted uh, June 30th, 2016. The mission of the board <clears throat> is to achieve fiscal responsibility and access to capital markets for, for Puerto Rico. At the time of the enactment of PROMESA, access to public markets was not available at all. Uh, that restricted any short-term capital infusions, and it was in a very dire situation, the fiscal structure and its future at the time. The board is made up of seven members. It's a very complicated appointment process. The process itself is currently uh, before the First Circuit has been challenged as being unconstitutional. 
I'll probably get to a little bit of that later in the discussion. But the members of the board were selected based on general recommendations given to the Department of Treasury under the Obama administration and the White House. And then it went through a process as well in the House and the Senate. And the way it is structured that the majority leader of the House gets to submit two, got to submit two lists under the statute to, um, to the uh, executive branch, and this was handled by Treasury. One list was to be composed of persons who had a re either a residence or a business in Puerto Rico to ensure at least one member was resident there or had a, an ongoing business. Another list had contained three persons then the majority, the minority in the House was able to submit one list. Same happened in the Senate, majority two lists, minority one list. That adds up to six appointees. Those lists were presented ultimately to the White House and the president under the statute was given one singular choice at his or her sole discretion under the statute. What happened was uh, interviews went on, headed, as I say, by the Department of Treasury. The board was selected. Uh, the six, seven members met. Uh, I was asked to talk about the composition itself of the board. I, I don't think there were any parameters set by Treasury as to exactly what they were looking for. Uh, and I talked to them later, they looked for a board that could work together generally. They thought had various different expertise. On the board itself, there are two bankers. Uh, they're a business person. There's an expert in social security retirement systems. There's a budgetary expert uh, who spent time with, in California working for two governors as a director of the budget. There's a law professor. I'm not the law professor. I don't consider myself a law professor. Professor. I fit into the retired judge aspect of this. But when you look at, when you look at the board, there are various people with experiences in insolvency law, budgetary issues, retirement issues, and it was believed that this board working together could achieve the goal. As I said, we were formed, I didn't, may not have said, we were formed August 31st. Uh, Congress, I think they had approximately 60 days to put the board together. On August 31st, we were notified we were on the board. Now, the first question comes up maybe is, so we're a board of whom? We're appointed by the President of the United States, uh, but we're not a federal board. Under the statute, we're not a federal board. We are a board of the Commonwealth. Although we are exempt from certain oversight from the Commonwealth, the way the statute is written, but at the same time, we were considered a Commonwealth board. That itself is being challenged in the courts as to whether we are. I think a couple of reasons why the statute was clear that we're not a board, a federal board. One was the selection process itself arguably would have gone through advice and consent of the Senate if the members were appointed and were part of a federal board. It was more likely that that argument would be made. It was made anyway. The second, I will speculate that if we were a federal board, people would claim causes of action against the federal government for things that we may do that are not perceived by people to be lawful. So the federal government itself was protecting and sealing itself off from those kinds of allegations, although that litigation commenced too. So the long and short of it is our role as a board is subject to a great deal of, of litigation as to where we really belong and how the members were appointed. And hopefully in the next couple of months we'll get some clarity on that. We're appoint appointed for a period of three years and can get reappointed. And each reappointment has to be done in the same, throughout, within the same process of the appointment. We have as reference, numerous professionals hired by the board. Our lead professional is Proskauer. O'Neill and Borges, our lead professional on island. We have uh, Brown Rudnick handling a special litigation uh, committee work. Our financial advisors are Citibank and PJT. And for the development of the fiscal plan, our advisors are McKinsey and Company. Now, 
the early stages of, of the board, we, as I say, we, we were formed around September, August 31st, September 1st. We had a couple of deadlines we had to face. We had to select a chair and have a public meeting by the end of, in, within 30 days. Uh, many of us didn't know each other. Uh, what the federal government did, and, and uh, they didn't really bring us together. We were all told by phone, and we were left to our own devices to organize. So it, the phase one, I'll call phase one of the board, was pretty rough going, trying to get things together and to move forward and meet our obligations under the statute. The powers of the board, many of them are set forth in section 104, hold hearings, take testimony, uh, receive evidence. But probably the, the, the greatest power we have to accomplish the mission is the development of the fiscal plan and then the budget that flows from the fiscal plan. Timing was not, in, in what I'll call phase two of this, on our side. The development of the fiscal plan is key to the work we do. That development was going on before we were appointed by the then governor, uh, who was soon to be the outgoing governor in two, at the end of 2016. So he was developing a fiscal plan, and we were working to get that done. He presented a fiscal plan probably late November, I think, of 2016. But we couldn't move forward very well with that fiscal plan because the new governor, the current governor, took office, and certainly and understandably he wanted input into the fiscal plan. So we did some modifications to it, et cetera. But one of the problems we had, and before we were appointed, the credit of bondholders particularly were commencing actions in courts attempting to collect on the bonds because the bonds weren't being paid. Now, something needs to be said about the debt amount. I think it's significant and daunting. The bonds are approximately $72 billion. The unfunded pension liability is approximately $55 billion. Just to put that pension liability in context, in the city of Detroit's bankruptcy, my understanding is, from some things I've read, that the Detroit city pensions were 60% funded. So they were 40% underfunded. The, most of the pensions on island were one or two percent funded. So the enormous lack of funding that put in jeopardy these systems. So we were then <clears throat> faced with this debt and what to do about it. And as I said, creditors were suing in the courts. And when PROMISA was enacted, it enacted a stay that was to stay into effect, would be in effect till February 15th. We had the authority to extend that stay, I believe, till May 1st. But at the end of the day, the only way after that we would get an effective stay would be if a Title III case under PROMESA, which is effectively an insolvency restructuring case, were filed. So we spent some time negotiating and seeing if we could get voluntary stays, et cetera. But at the end of the day, as uh, we move forward, it became apparent <coughs> that a Title III filing may well be necessary. The Title III filing comes about if, as just to put it in general terms, that it's requested, or there's this language in the statute, requested by the head of the entity. Now, the head of the entity would be the governor. The governor requested the Title III filing. We filed uh, the Commonwealth. We filed PREPA. We filed another, a number of, of other entities in early May 2016, uh, 17, excuse me. <coughs> Thereafter, we had to stay in place, and we were then before Judge Laura Taylor Swain from the Southern District of New York District Court. The judge, Judge Swain, was appointed under the statute by the Chief Justice of the United States, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, and she sits by designation in the First Circuit, which is the circuit within which Puerto Rico resides as a federal entity, and she has engaged in the last two and a half years in, a, in an enormous amount of work in dealing with the issues that arise under the Title III case. <coughs> We've been in 
um, negotiations for quite a while with creditor constituencies. We've had a number of public meetings. We've had a whole host of interactions with the governor. Uh, our relationship with the governor is, is always cordial, I think professional, but we certainly don't see eye to eye on a number of important issues, and we've had <coughs> to try to work those out. Sometimes we've gone to court had to ask the court for clarification, uh, and we have received that, and some of those issues are on appeal as well. But I think in some as to where we are now, we're in the midst of trying to develop a plan uh, under the Title III. We're in extensive negotiations. On the debt side, it's, it is accurate. We filed an objection along with the Creditors Committee to the debt alleging that it was improperly issued. Uh, and that is, objection is before the court, and I'm sure it's gonna be a number of months before it actually gets any real movement before the court on the debt. But if we are successful, the debt, that portion of the debt would be eliminated. Uh, it's unclear what the impact of that would be ultimately on the amount of debt service that may, may be paid. Uh, but nonetheless, we have an obligation under the, under the statute, an obligation in any insolvency proceeding to only pay allowed claims in order to determine what an allowed claim is. You need to look at it and uh, make that determination. And if you don't think it should be an allowed claim, bring it to the court's attention. So effectively, that, what, that is what we did. We based our objection on a report done by the Kobe and Kim firm. The report was done pursuant to Section 104 of PROMESA, examining the debt itself, looking at the procedures and practices in terms of the issuance of the debt, and to make recommendations in which that port report does rec make recommendations with respect to things that could be done that maybe enhance uh, the process in which the debt is, is, is issued. But that's, that, if you're interested, that report is, is worth reading. It's on our website. And so we will also, in that report, besides objecting to the claim, we have, as I said, hired Brown Rudnick as our special counsel. That special counsel will look at the report and do its own analysis outside of issues on the report to determine whether other kinds of causes of action should be brought on behalf of the Commonwealth in an effort to bring funds into the Commonwealth. But all of that process is going on now, and I, you know, I would not be wise to comment on what we think we may do or not do, but that is an ongoing process. Many of the limitations on the time in which we, of which we need to do something is, will probably come due in May of this year, which would be the two-year anniversary of the filing of the Title III for the Commonwealth. But, we will make determinations and move forward with that at some point in the future. I was asked to comment, at least now, on one other thing, and then I'll, I'll stop. Uh, I was asked if the board has a position on a law, H.R. 683. It's a disclosure requirement law for professional engaged in a Title III case. And, and I, I'll probably get into it later, but the, the, you know, the report board has not taken a position on that. We expect that we will be asked by Congress to take a position on it. I have my own position on, on it that I'll, I'll share, at least for now, that, uh, you know, and I think the board would probably agree, but I don't, can't sit here and speak for them, that disclosure, uh, more disclosure, the better. I mean, it's, it's cumbersome at times to do the disclosure, but it's important. It's a very fundamental aspect of the bankruptcy code. Uh, disclosure by professionals. However, uh, in the PROMESA legislation, that particular section for disclosure was not included. Uh, it also isn't included in the bankruptcy code section that deals with municipality bankruptcies. I'm not really sure why, but in any event, PROMESA was originally acted, enacted without the need for disclosure under the bankruptcy code, and it's that is what was presented as a law 683 in which Congress may act on in, in the near future as to whether or not it would incorporate that law into PROMESA or that section. With that,
Turn it over to Andrew Hoffman. Now, okay. Uh, thank you very much. We're going to have a, um, uh, an informal question period, but we're going to try to hear the panelists first, and then maybe we can get a conversation going afterwards as to some of the things that, that you hear here tonight or some things that you wish were, uh, were uh, addressed. Uh, I will have some questions just to get the ball rolling. Now, let's, let's, let's hear uh, from Alvin and see what he has to say uh, from a very different perspective. We have here the, the, the official, no, the, the regulators, and now we here have the unions. <laughs> well, you know, I think first I would say this, well, let me get the legal part out of the way first. I'm obviously speaking on behalf of myself and not either CIU or the creditors committee. I always have to get that out of the way. Secondly, you know, it's easy to talk about workers and unions and say, oh, the unions, but, but really, when we think about the workers of, of Puerto Rico, we have to think of them as people who live in Puerto Rico, as consumers in Puerto Rico, and really as the engine that drives economic development in Puerto Rico. In other words, in a lot of ways, the interest of public workers are really the interest of Puerto Rico writ large. Now you might think that's a very bold claim, but the evidence actually backs it up. There has been 10 years of austerity cuts in Puerto Rico. I, I started at this in 2008 when uh, Governor For then Governor Fortunio enacted Law 7. That law was supposed to correct a $3 billion structural deficit and we were promised that a combination of that COFINA being used as essentially debtor in possession financing, dip financing, a type of emergency financing, and the raising of taxes would right the ship. Now, 10,000 workers later who are got laid off, what you see is an increase, what you saw immediately was an increase by 3% of the unemployment rate in Puerto Rico, and then a continued decrease in gross national product. In other words, the lessons that were learned in Greece did not come to Puerto Rico fast enough. In other words, getting rid of workers and the money that they spend doesn't make sense in Puerto Rico as a, as a tool for macroeconomic adjustment. I imagine that there's probably some people here who are lawyers at you know, various law firms. And, you know, when you hit a, a fiscal crisis, it's easy to say, hey, okay, we gotta tighten the belt, we gotta not spend so much on coffee and lunch, and okay, we can't make a couple of hires. But there's a reality. If you have a secular economic crisis at your firm, because you're not bringing in revenues, you're not gonna cut your way to profitability. And it's the same thing here in Puerto Rico. And so in a lot of ways, the way we've seen this at SEIU is to quite frankly say, this is not just about workers. This really is all about Puerto Rico. And the reason is very simple. It's simple economics. If you keep money on island and have that money cycle through, then you're looking at an economic multiplier of about three times. In other words, $1 in, $3 spent. If you have money that does not stay on island, let's say some types of federal relief, for example, the multiplier there is 1.3 times. This is economics, folks. It, 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 it has a humanitarian tie, but it, it's, it's economics. And when people say, hey, we look like, you know, we've, we've, we've had progress here, right? There's issues about the debt that have come up to the fore. There are issues regarding the resolution of COFINA. You know, SEIU filed an objection to the COFINA deal for not being economically feasible. And, and that's the reality, is that Puerto Rico does not have the economic tools or, and the oversight board for, for the, the best of intentions doesn't control economic policy. In other words, they don't have the tools to, 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 all the tools needed to stimulate growth. So, you know, could workers have their rights cut? Sure, but guess what? On the other side, you're gonna create a, a demand problem because workers aren't gonna have money to spend. I mean, I think about a dear friend of mine and who is a, a pastor as well as a teacher 
And, you know, he says to me, Alvin, like, I have a daughter. She's applying for college. I don't, I don't want to name names, but a dear friend of mine in Puerto Rico. Should she stay around? And I said, no, because there's a couple of reasons. One, the COFINA deal for all the legal semantics is fundamentally not affordable. Now, you might say, okay, well, what's the union's position on what's affordable? Because, you know, you can go criticize all day without, you know, providing a real solution. I would submit that, you know, what we state in our objection is 84%, 80, 84, 80% round air is a good place to start. Now, of course, everyone here might say 80%, that is bonkers. That is a huge number. Well, yes and no. Actually, if you want to base that on Puerto Rico's gross, I mean, its average income, which is about 21,000 a year, and compare it to the states, then really the haircut should be 96%. So how do I get to 84%? Well, easy. We look at what is the average income versus the, of, of each state versus its average debt load, equal it out and say, all right, if you put Puerto Rico smack in the middle as the 25, then guess what? You end up with the, the need for about an 80 to 85% haircut. This is not my numbers. These are you know economists with PhDs who, who know this stuff way better than I. So the question it raises as far as how is this all going? I don't think it's going great for workers right now. And I don't think it's going great for Puerto Ricans. And you know, the, one of the toughest questions that I ever, I have, you know, my friend, my, my pastor, teacher friend, for example, members of my family in Puerto Rico, you know, sometimes Puerto Ricans who, who are living here in the States will ask me, hey Alvin, wh where do you think this is gonna go? And I said, guys, we're going on the road to Greece. We are going to be redoing this in 10 years. We do not have the tools to wrap this all up because even if you take the COFINA deal as it is, you basically use up most of the debt capacity short of two things, basically a macroeconomic infusion of, of, of outward cash and secondly, policy changes to make Puerto Rico more competitive. And it's really easy to look at the labor laws and say, oh, these labor laws were created by a socialist government in a socialist time and their lefty rhetoric. But the reality is, when you're making on average $20,000 a year, what are you doing with it? You're spending it. You don't have time to put money in a 401k. You don't have time to save money. You're spending it because you're trying to keep afloat, especially when you get a light bill that says special charge, special charge, special charge. And what are those special charges for? Those special charges are to pay for revenue bonds. And workers are really feeling the squeeze. And, you know, those workers who got laid off in Law 7, there's some of them I still talk to. Alvin, when can I come back? And you know, what, what, am I, what are we supposed to answer about that? I think the best we can do as a union is, and as, as workers is exactly what we have been trying to do. You know, there have been questions for many years about whether Puerto Rico's debt was, was sustainable and legal. Frankly, like, you know, four years ago, people did not want to listen to SEIU raising questions about this. When the Debt Commission was created, people didn't want to listen. You know, okay, at a certain point, maybe a track record's developed and maybe we're saying, hey, this is, this is looking like Greece part two. You know, there's, there's a joke amongst bankruptcy lawyers, or not a joke, but a, a saying that, um, you know, you have a chapter 11 and then you have a chapter 22 and a 33, meaning like stores will redo bankruptcies over and over. You know, I, I think we're gonna go into a title six and a, and a title nine. And that's not good for workers, but we're gonna keep fighting for them because again, it's easy to say we, we have to satisfy and look at financial creditors. But the reality is, if you satisfy those financial creditors like, completely, then what's gonna happen is that fount of repayment is just not gonna be economically viable. It's simple economics. So that's a lot of how, how, how we've you know, been approaching the issue, is we've looked and said, what, where's the debt? What's happening to the debt? Because again, we have a, a disease, right? If you go after workers and say, Let's cut workers another 10%. Guess what? We're gonna be doing this all over again because Law 7 taught us a lesson. 
oh wait, no, 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 it didn't teach us enough of a lesson. Actually, we, we came, you know, 2014, the government said, hey, we need more concessions. Guess what? We're still here because there's an underlying sickness that has to get cured. And part of that cure is not gonna happen until the debt overhang gets dealt with and gets dealt with with significant haircuts. And that's not a word that anybody likes, but the reality is that a lot of the people who are participating in the bankruptcy are people who came in a couple years ago with PROMESA from whatever their constituencies. Uh, you know, our workers, uh, you know, my family, they're gonna be there, they were there before, they're gonna be there afterwards. My mom's buried in, in, in the cemetery in Gudabo, right? She's been there since 98 when she died of Lou Gehrig's disease. And the way I'm looking at this is like, wow, this arc of, you know, the Puerto Rico that I go up to go to visiting as a kid, especially in Rio Piedras in the central, is now a piece of urban blight. That urban blight is not gonna be able to support the economic activity needed to repay the debt. It's, it's that simple. And so the way we've, we've been looking at this, like I said, is look at like what's, what's gonna happen with the debt and then also take that pressure off and then work to, to protect the pension interest of our members. Again, though, remember in Puerto Rico, the average pension is around $25,000. We're not talking about huge amounts of money. And it's frankly been mismanaged. If you look, compare Puerto Rico's pension law to ERISA, if this was an, uh, let me step back a step. Just as a general point of law, under ERISA, ERISA exempts state pension funds from its, its reach. So in other words, if you're in the private sector, especially you think here in New York, you're at, you know, like our members at 1199, 32BJ, those pension funds are regulated by ERISA, which is very strict. But because the state law's pensions are exempt from ERISA, they have more latitude to do what they wanna do. Now imagine this, you have a 401k. I, I, I do, I'm sure a few of you others also have 401ks, but you're, that money is not there because it's actually being shifted to pay for other obligations. Or it's being, if it, you don't know if it's 100% there because there's questions about how, where, how is it being managed because again, you have a pension system that at the start, is, as Judge Gonzalez rightly noted, was at one to 2% funding. That, that, that's problematic. But that money is, is basically consumption-based money because it's for workers who what? Go get their medication, who get, get their food, who get their expenses covered. Now, I'll, I'll just end with this. You know, right now, the, the fiscal plan from workers is, offers um, $100 a month toward medical plan. Now, for those of you who who visited there, um, I, I, I gotta admit, I'm, I'm a fan of the Cheesecake Factory from time to time. You could spend 100 bucks at the Cheesecake Factory on an Asian salad, some egg rolls, oh, those are my favorites, and some, a cheesecake, and do that for two. How is that gonna cover the, the fees for somebody who needs diabetic medication on a monthly basis? How's that gonna cover you know, the, the, the medicines needed for heart risk? You know, that takes me back to, to my friends and the workers I talk to who say, hey, Alvin, how, how is this gonna end? And to me, I'm like, given the current course, I really don't think it's going to end well, short of developing real macroeconomic tools that supplement the policy tools that are available at the local level. So sorry for a lot of jargon there, but the reality is that we objected to the COFINA agreement because the economics weren't there and Judge Swain, I think, rightfully raised the issue of, of feasibility for later. And we'll have to see what comes out of the next set of, of, of negotiations and actions. But hopefully, we'll, we'll see something happen there. I think one last thing I wanna to touch on is um, also 
Um, there have been issues or questions. I, I see some, there's a, a person, in, a couple people in the audience with like audit, uh, audit shirts. I, I wanna, there's been a lot of misinformation about the, the audit and about how that works and why we needed to, to have that happen. And so I, I wanna clear a couple of those things up. First of all, when the audit commission was in existence, the, what we tried to do at that time is have a audit that was based on three phases, a compliance function, a financial function, and a um, performance function. What does that mean? Compliance function, are you in line with the debt limit? Okay. And that's the part that has gotten the most attention. <coughs> performance, is the money taken from a bond issuance being effectively used and creating a positive economic effect? And then the third part is going to be the um, Compliance financial, that's the performance, and then financial, I think, speaks for itself, right? What we were trying to, I think a lot of people were saying, look, what about claims? What about bringing lawsuits against banks? What about, and, and, and part of it is, at the time, the for, that's, that's called what the auditors would call the forensic function, right? If there's indi indicia of fraud, then you start looking that way. But I think first, you actually have to clear the table and get to see what's going on. I know there's some people who've said, We've essentially done an audit where some parts of that, I, I, would, I would push back a bit because I think what you've heard me just say is something very comprehensive and very detailed. Like auditors go through a checklist, right, to check all sorts of documents that they need. And I would say that here, even if it's, if it's after the fact, we'll probably need a postmortem in Puerto Rico. But let me speak to the, to the, to the fraud function, I think, <laughs> You know, there's there's been a lot of throwing around of, oh, this person should pay this or this person should, or this. You know, everybody should look into this role. I, I I think the reality is the the important part right now is to figure out if you're going to go there, the civil claims insofar as what bankruptcy professionals would say is bringing money into the estate. So SEIU for four years ago tried to uh, convince the government of Puerto Rico to bring suits uh, FINRA arbitration for auction rate securities. And we can, I won't bore you with what an auction rate security is for now, but if you wanna talk about it, ask me later. And no one, if we were looking at a $100 million claim and it wasn't brought. And to me, that is utter madness. And part of the reason is like, hey, we can't do that because we'll upset the markets. Well, I hate to tell you, has anybody had lunch with the market today? Is the market like a person that, whose feelings you can hurt? or who gets offended? No, it's, it's a combination of rational economic, or sometimes irrational economic decisions. The fact that, Port that even Argentina was able to go to market after torturing bondholders for years demonstrates that when there's a deal to be had, the money will come back to go to market. That's all I have to say, thank you. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's quite a lot, <laughs> it's quite a lot. Thank you very much, Alvin. Uh, now we move to another, well, actually, let's follow up a little bit on that issue. Let's, let's have uh, our next panelist, uh, Luis Jose Torres, uh, talk to us because he is very involved in this Citizens for Debt audit uh, group, and maybe he can give us some more information on that. Thank you. Good evening. I'd, I'd like to start off by thanking Natasha and the rest of the members of the Puerto Rico Task Force for inviting me to participate in this event. Um, as, as Judge Fiol Mata said, I'm, I'm a member of the Puerto Rico Citizens Front for the Audit of the Public Debt, as well as its Citizens Commission, um, a nonprofit organization created when the government of Puerto Rico unsurprisingly abdicated on its responsibility to audit Puerto Rico's bond issuances for the past five decades. I speak today on behalf of these organizations, but I also must speak from my own account as an activist and as one of the very few people in this room that would, will actually have to bear the consequences of PROMESA and the policies advanced by the board via the approval of fiscal and debt adjustment plans. The Citizens Front was created in 2016 as a then existing government created audit commission, which Alvin was referring to, published a report concluding that at least half of Puerto Rico's debt might have been accrued in violation of several provisions of the Constitution. While the front was being created to support the work of that commission, 
PROMESA, it now seems, was being enacted to curtail it, as well as to further limit the people of Puerto Rico's capacity to govern itself out of this crisis. The Citizens Front was created under three guiding principles, and, and it is in those principles that I would like to reflect on tonight. The first of these principles is that the people of Puerto Rico deserve to know how the debt that we are being asked to pay was accumulated. That is to say, we deserve to know how this crisis came to be. We have not been made aware of the public debts that, they pay, that, that we pay through their tax, to our taxes. Government institutions, particularly those that deal with economic and fiscal policy, seem to treat our people as little more than passive spectators. Thus, while the Supreme Court of Puerto Rico has generally recognized a constitutional right of access to information, the government of Puerto Rico has fostered a culture of opacity with regards to effective access to financial and economic information. Even worse, there are no incentives to respond to requests for information, as government officials and institutions suffer no consequences for ignoring or arbitrarily denying these requests until a court finally forces them to provide information. It is of little surprise then, as Judge Fiolmata was um, covering during her introduction, that organizations like the Center for Investigative Journalism, Open Spaces, and the Citizens Commission itself have had to repeatedly sue the Puerto Rican government for access to important information related to bond issuances, fiscal plans, and economic subsidies, to name a few. While these complaints have proven mostly successful, the considerable delays in finally gaining access to information are enough of a victory for a government that prefers to live in the shadows than to face democratic scrutiny over, over its actions. Sadly, two years after PROMESA, the Fiscal Control Board has failed, to, has failed to distinguish itself from the Commonwealth in advancing significant transparency practices. In fact, after unsuccessfully claiming that the board was not bound by Puerto Rico's constitutional right of access to information and that it was exempt from those types of suits. In a pending complaint filed by the Center for Investigative Journalism, the board's lawyers now seek to restrict access to documents related to the elaboration and certification of the government's fiscal plans by arguing that granting those requests would be damaging for the Puerto Rican economy or that it would impair the board's ability to perform its statutory duties. These categories of exemptions are not only wholly inexistent under Puerto Rico or even federal access to information law, but they also dangerously place the determination of what is potentially damaging or obstructing to its duties in the hands of the same officials and institutions genera generating these documents. A second principle of the Citizens Front is that the people of Puerto Rico should actively participate and be involved in all of the decision-making processes concerning this step, as well as in the evaluation of the austerity measures being forced upon us. The specter of Puerto Rico's debt has placed a terrible cost upon the lives of the residents of our archipelago. In the past three decades, the government has closed and or privatized public utilities, hospitals, schools, it has promoted environmentally damaging policies and infrastructure projects. It has sold or repurposed some of our best ecological and agricultural public lands. It has dismissed tens of thousands of public and private employees, reduced public pensions, impaired the rights of public uh, and private employees, as well as ignored collective bargaining agreements, all while increasing taxes, reducing public housing spaces, and expediting eviction proceedings, to name a few. All of this has been done in the name of right-sizing our public sphere, a euphemism for the brutal pain these measures have levied on our people, just so that our government can have enough resources to continue paying off existing debts and issue new ones that are then used to finance some of the same painful policies. That thousands of us died in the aftermath, in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, not as a direct result of the winds of their destruction, but as a consequence of lack of medicines, adequate treatment, potable water, food, transportation, and energy, is but a reflection of a logic that has, for decades, placed the debt before the people in Puerto Rico. Two years after PROMESA, both the government and the board have doubled down on enhanced vari variations of the same types of austerity measures imposed for the past three decades. In fact, this reiteration has been generally adopted in the election of, of, of PROMESA's own requirement that public essential services be guaranteed. 
that the board has moved forward with the certification of fiscal plans and the approval of debt restructuring agreements without providing a clear definition of even this limited baseline of Puerto Rico's public service apparatus speaks lengths about their concern for the well-being and the dignity of our most vulnerable individuals and communities. As with transparency, these developments have been advanced all while reducing instances for public participation and deliberation to a bare minimum. If actual control for Puerto Rico's fiscal and economic policies is in the hands of an unelected body that does not respond or even relate to the people of Puerto Rico, what's left of the liberal ideal of democratic deliberation? A good example lies in PROMESA's Title V, which creates a critical project framework that essentially codifies Puerto Rico's Act No. 76 of 2000 as amendment, a measure enacted to exempt emergency projects and works performed after hurricanes and other devastating events from compliance with regular administrative procedures and regulations. In this case, however, via the designation as a critical project, the board can effectively preclude a major infrastructure work not seeking to address an emergency from having significant citizen oversight and participation. Further in Puerto Rico's slow descent into what Giorgio Agamben calls a permanent state of exception, where legal and constitutional norms and principles and public spaces for discussion and participation are suppressed in the name of a never-ending emergency. And all the while, the government enacts new speech curtailing measures, which create a police state that seems to prosecute more speech-related crimes than domestic and sexual abuses against women. Finally, the Citizens Front believes that the people of Puerto Rico should not be forced to pay illegal, illegitimate, and odious debts. To borrow, from, to, to borrow a quote from Game of Thrones, we need not be Lannisters. The claim that these debts have to be repaired merely disguises the ideological for the juridical. No comprehensive audit has been undertaken to explore the force of claims that a significant amount of Puerto Rico's bond issuances were used for balancing fiscal deficits since 1974. An argument recently adopted by the board itself, albeit only for three general obligation bond issuances or that the debt of public corporations that did not generate their own revenues, that issued debt for the benefit of the government that, that, and, and were effectively controlled by the Commonwealth, had to be included in the constitutional debt limit calculus, as the board recently concluded with regards to the public building authority debt, but failed to do so with the COFINA structure. Or that notes and refinancing bonds also had to be counted towards the debt limit, with the consequence that Puerto Rico could have been violating said constitutional provision well before the board is willing to acknowledge. Or that the practice of refinancing debt payments, effectively extending their lives well over the 30-year limit fixed in the Constitution, also rendered these issuances null and void. While litigating these issues certainly carries a lot of risk, said risk is limited, given how steep as a debt sentence is being imposed on the residents of Puerto Rico. A citizen's debt audit would demonstrate how much of this debt did not benefit the people of Puerto Rico. Rather, publicly available information has shown hints at the illegitimate nature of at least parts of this debt. COFINA's debt issuances, for instance, were not only used to cover budget deficits, um, a practice that the board has recently recognized as unconstitutional, but also to pay unsecured debt via the issuance of debt securitized with parts of the sales tax, and even worse, to finance the dismissal of tens of thousands of public employees via Act No. 7 of 2009. PREPA's debt issuances, on the other hand, were partly sold on the premise of the construction of major infrastructure works that not only had not been approved at the time of the issuances, but proved to be economically, environmentally, and socially inviolable, as was the case of the two natural gas pipelines proposed by the Acevedo Vila and Fortunio Bosset administrations. That, however, did not prevent PREPA from handing out hundreds of millions in contracts, some to corporations and individuals with strong ties to the ruling administrations that never provided any benefits for the people. Finally, an independent debt audit would also document how Puerto Rico is being played by a system that allows entities to accumulate vast quantities of our debt at a fraction of their original cost, and then negotiate restructuring agreements that will allow them to reap substantial profits from the pockets of our people all while requiring additional austerity measures to justify paying these creditors well in excess of what they paid for the credits. A comprehensive audit of Puerto Rico's debt issuances for the past five decades will also serve to show 
how there are structural factors that have not only hampered Puerto Rico's economic development, but have played a crucial role in the accumulation of this debt. The most obvious of this is, of course, the impact of Puerto Rico's political relationship with the United States, and with it, the application of the Jones Act, the Dormant Commerce Clause, and the plenary, plenary powers doctrine, to name a few, on the accumulation of Puerto Rico's debt. Colonialism definitely hurts, as Judge Torruella has so eloquently asserted, but colonialism also costs. That PROMESA expressly exempted the federal government from any responsibility over Puerto Rico's debt not only provided a new example of our political subordination, it also meant that PROMESA was designed to fail, or rather, that its stated purpose of striving for Puerto Rico's economic stability was not its real purpose. Attempting to restructure Puerto Rico's debts and achieve fiscal solvency without exploring the role that colonialism has had in our economic development is akin to attempting to repair an old broken down house just by painting over its cracks. In the end, two years after PROMESA, as Alvin mentioned, the quality of our lives has not improved. If anything, we are now faced with the prospect of mortgaging our next 40 years particularly that of our future generations, just for the prospect of paying off debt that gave very little to us, but has taken almost everything from us. In this regard, we believe that a comprehensive, independent debt audit is a necessary means, not only towards strengthening any and all claims of illegality of Puerto Rico's debt issuances, but also as a strategy for education and public participation, as a strategy to learn from our mistakes. It is not an end point in our work, but rather the conclusion of its beginning. Until then, however, we will have to continue to resist and endure, or rather, we will continue to grow and resist until we have grown enough not to have to resist. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Luis for a very comprehensive explanation of the reasons for uh, a profound and thorough debt audit. Uh, I will ask Natasha now to talk to us about the humanitarian aspects of uh, PROMESA, of uh, the actions taken by the board and the actions not taken by the board or by the governments that have to do with uh, uh, humanitarian aspects of uh, our people. Thank you, Gracia. Um, I, I feel well represented by the previous two um, panelists. Uh, let me just begin by saying that, um, that while PROMESA has been interpreted as being a uh, constitutionally appropriate um, uh, legislative act, that the board itself is anti-democratic, colonial, and would be illegal anywhere else in the world. Nowhere would we allow uh, an institution to be created that by one government that supposedly represents another government that's composed of seven financial uh, executives that serve in their individual capacity, that meet in private, that meet outside of the nation that they're responsible for overseeing, and that have veto power over the democratically elected government of a people. It's a model that can only exist under uh, colonialism, and that really exposes the political relationship, the underlying political relationship that uh, is colonial in nature between the U.S. and Puerto Rico. Uh, we that's important context for what for the decisions that come out of the board and um, and what you've heard so far tonight uh, as you've heard also the debt um, is considered by many to be wholly illegitimate uh, if not in, entirely in, in part and um, in large quantities not only just the six billion that was recently recognized as such but much more than that for the reasons that have been adequately stated what I want to talk about is um, what's called the humanitarian crisis in Puerto Rico pre and post Maria and then bring in the hurricane Maria context I um, prefer not to refer to it as a humanitarian crisis. We're talking about a human rights crisis, and those are two very different things, right? This isn't a humanitarian crisis just because people are suffering. We're talking about the rights of people and how those rights are being by design 
uh, intervened and undermined uh, by uh, political and economic policies that are intended to do just that. Uh, and the human rights framework is important when we talk about economic uh, policy as well. The uh, human, human rights crisis has been um, only deepened in the last several years since PROMESA, but it really results from the economic and political crisis that exists on the island, um, even before the hurricane. And there's no way to avoid a human rights crisis when austerity is official economic policy. In fact, austerity only uh, deepens uh, uh, the violation, systemic violation of human rights, and it's not just an, an opinion, it's been largely recognized um, by international human rights mechanisms and bodies, which I'll refer to uh, later on. But you can't have cuts to public goods and services. Um, you can't have fundamentally dismantle public services and destroy public goods while promoting economic development for an island. Um, what we see is massive school closures, hundreds of closures of public schools across the island, privatization of those schools, cuts to the highest, uh, the uh, University of Puerto Rico, one of the oldest institutions in the Caribbean, the largest uh, public university in the Caribbean, 11 campuses going to be slashed at least in half. Uh, so how do you continue to educate a population at an affordable rate so that you have an educated workforce if you're attacking the institutions that are responsible for, for educating um, the nation? Uh, attacks on public health facilities, infrastructure projects, roads, um, selling off of public assets, dismantling public goods, and simultaneously promoting policies of privatization of those services, right? These what are called triple P PPPs, public-private partnerships that are really about the privatization of essential public goods. The fundamental role of government is to ensure that these goods are provided, that people have basic education, that they have health care, that they have decent housing, et cetera. And so when the role of government is being redefined because you have an oversight board that's determining what the priorities of that government should be and vetoing decisions, by the board, um, by the government, and when you have push for privatization to re-envision what, how the government is going to provide those services, it it sets up um, deep structural inequality that Puerto Rico already disproportionately suffers from. Puerto Rico has the third worst structural poverty uh, in the world, behind South Africa and Namibia, right? Where over. 45% uh, of the population live at internationally recognized poverty levels. That was before the hurricane. Right. Privatization is not only of schools and healthcare facilities, it's also of infrastructure projects, the airport, bridges, roads, energy, uh, and energy sources. So you set up a system where only those that can afford to live there will. Well, who's going to be affording to live there? Those who are currently receiving tax incentives, either based on their individual incomes and capital gains taxes, or corporate actors who continue to be incentivized to relocate and set up in Puerto Rico, don't necessarily have any obligations to invest in Puerto Rico, to hire Puerto Rican workforce. You know, $30 billion that gets generated in Puerto Rico by foreign um, corporations, primarily U.S., generate $30 billion of wealth that does not stay in Puerto Rico, right? which is why Puerto Rico is poorer than the poorest state, Mississippi. Uh, tremendous wealth is generated on that island that, is not, that does not stay in the hands of Puerto Ricans. And you know, none of this is surprising when we think of a policy of austerity when you consider that PROMESA really comes from, uh, the design of PROMESA comes from the Kruger Report, you know, a report that was commissioned of former IMF officials by creditors to show Congress what a legislative draft could look like uh, that would address potential debt restructuring, right? And so we see continuously the same bad actors involved, and not just bad actors in Puerto Rico, bad actors who've been involved um, in the foreclosure crisis in New York, uh, in, the, in the US um, 10 years ago, and that continuously engage in bad behavior. In addition, we see attacks on civil rights and civil liberties on the island and deep, deepened state repression. 
right? So we see the role, when we think about the role of government being fundamentally reimagined, that includes the police force. The police force, we see their role as protecting, um, of course, members of the board, but also, you know, investors, creditors, private property, and attacking um, citizens and public protests and manifestations, increasingly militarized and riot gear, uh, private military contractors that are being, and defense contractors that are being, and police forces that are being employed on the island. You know, it has, uh, and the, the, the privatization of public goods promotes this model where goods now become commodities because they are held in private hands. And so private actors employ private police forces to protect their commodities because they're no longer part of the public sphere where pe everyone has access to them. You have what are being, what a uh, uh, civil rights lawyer um, that I know calls constitution-free zones that are being created because you have a government with no money to pay out judgments for constitutional rights violations or civil rights violations. Uh, they can't afford to pay out judgments, which means lawyers aren't taking these cases whenever there's civil rights violations that are, or human rights violations that are occurring. You have increasingly aggressive um, uh, police activity, just to stick with the police for a moment, and no consequences for unlawful behavior, right? But it could be first in, protected First Amendment activity, it could be discrimination, it could be a number of civil rights issues that take place. And there's no consequences for unlawful activity, right? And if you do sue, you're now, your case is automatically being transferred to Title III proceedings, right, where federal judges are being stripped if you file in federal court, or state judges are being stripped of jurisdiction to be able to attend these issues because you're seeking damages, which is what the real remedy is, not just declaratory or injunctive relief. You're seeking damages, and your case is automatically transferred to Title III because now, as a victim of a civil rights violation, you're seen as a creditor, and you have to go stand in line behind Aurelius and BlackRock and everyone else to try to, or release your damages claim. So you're forced to have to choose, you know, am I gonna withdraw the main remedy that I'm seeking, and, or continue with a remedy that isn't gonna actually be that useful, right? The lack of access to public information, which was, which was spoken about when the press has to continuously sue in order to access public, basic public information, such as how many people died after a hurricane. Right? Or what are the government's plans to prepare for future disasters? Things that everybody should, should know. There's limited access to public uh, meetings, uh, public disclosures, um, and the government is moving prisoners to the United States. Right? These are just some of the basic kind of attacks on some of the civil liberties that we've seen within the last year. And then Maria happened. Right. Then we had the third worst hurricane in U.S. history, the worst hurricane in Puerto Rico in over a century. And what we saw was really a criminally negligent government response at all levels to addressing um, what people saw as a humanitarian disaster, but which was really just surfacing the deep structural inequality that already existed for the reasons that I, that I mentioned. You know, when you have... Uh, uh, a, a, a colonial relationship where you don't have access to control your own resources, your own economic vision, to be able to receive aid from fellowing neighboring uh, Caribbean countries who are intending to send electricians and physicians and aid because something like the Jones Act exists. And you have to rely exclusively on one country for all of your aid in a country under an administration that's hostile to your interests and believes that throwing paper towels at people who just you know, lost their homes and some of their family members is an appropriate response. You know, that, that wasn't just a humanitarian crisis. What that was was a colonial crisis. It was really surfacing deep structural inequality that existed. We, of course, have seen the uh, extremely deficient response by this administration in continuing to deal with the just recovery and disaster relief. That's being led by FEMA. Um, FEMA's response from the very beginning was to be obstructionist, right? It was really to centralize aid unnecessarily um, to make it impossible for, for people and municipalities to access it, intentionally uh, obstructionist, and admittedly was underwhelmingly prepared 
uh, for the type of disaster that they had predicted uh, was, was due Puerto Rico because of uh, the severity of climate change. Um, you know, FEMA uh, evicted recipients who were under uh, temporary short-term housing assistance, uh, about 2,000 or so households that were staying in hotels all throughout the United States and Puerto Rico. They decided to only um, allow them, people who had lost their homes, who were seeking medical treatment in the U.S., who had lost their jobs. A almost everyone had some medical, um, uh, mental or physical condition that they were suffering from. Uh, whereas we saw after Hurricane Katrina that FEMA extended temporary shelter assistance for 27 months, they decided after nine months that people would be evicted. Um, it's been over about 18 months or so since the hurricane, and yet if you fly into Puerto Rico, what you will see is a sea of blue tarps still. People have not had their homes rebuilt. Yesterday, Law 360, um, the website, released an article talking about how uh, families continue to have buckets in their homes to collect water every time it rains so that their homes don't flood because housing has not been restored. There has been no housing. And yet there has been tens of millions of dollars of very lucrative contracts that the federal government has awarded, and yet we have not seen any meaningful housing um, be built. All of these policies have produced uh, forced migration, and people uh, have forced to leave Puerto Rico because they don't have dignified housing options. FEMA currently is fighting uh, uh, an expenditure of what they themselves had determined with the government of Puerto Rico to be about $1.5 billion that they were going to spend in critical infrastructure redevelopment projects for essential services like schools and hospitals like the um, Diagnostic and Treatment Center in uh, Vieques. They have since decided that only $500 million of that was necessary, about you know, a $300 decrease in what was needed. And they have opted to for the position that they are only required to build at pre-hurricane uh, standards, meaning they're not going to build to anticipate future disasters, right? They're gonna build the same type of structures that didn't withstand the hurricane to begin with. Instead of um, strengthening structurally institutions, exposing you know, very vulnerable communities to the same types of conditions that, um, that they continue to live with now. Uh, FEMA denied 62% of claims of households that sought uh, reimbursement and assistance for having um, property destroyed, either personal belongings or physical or real property destroyed, 62% 62, 62 of claims. That meant only 38, uh, um, yeah, 38% of individuals received assistance from FEMA for a number of reasons. Among those, FEMA insisted that people didn't have what they called verifiable ownership, that they couldn't produce adequate title documents. Well, because title doesn't exist the same way in Puerto Rico, and you don't have to have deeds to show proof of title uh, or the right to a property the same way that in other jurisdictions. FEMA was made aware of that very early on and continued to deny and to deny appeals for households. Um, after tremendous amount of advocacy at all levels, they've decided to accept a sworn affidavit that uh, legal services groups in Puerto Rico, including Ayuda Legal Puerto Rico, helped draft. However, they took the position that it was not their responsibility to notify the 77,000 households whose claims had been denied precisely because of this issue, and that instead it specifically said that the burden was on civil society groups to figure out who those individuals were and inform them of their right now to be able to use the sworn declaration uh, to have their cases be reopened. Obviously, after the hurricane, there's ongoing concern, public health concerns that were um, we saw exacerbated, access to clean and safe um, drinking water. What we've also seen as part of the kind of the disaster capitalist model is tremendous deregulation of industry. And that includes environmental toxins like ashes and, and energy waste. Um, while pushing through simultaneously mega projects with no public hearings, with little to no public input from um, uh, civil society and groups, um, and cl literally closing the doors of the legislature to any public hearings where people could have any form of meaningful participation. There was a, a brief moratorium on mortgages for homes that people couldn't live in that were un uninhabitable. 
Uh, that I think was a, a misnomer to call it a moratorium because at the end of the four months or so where um, people didn't have to pay their mortgage, they were then forced to pay it all at once, four months backed up all at once for those who still hadn't found employment again. And now we're also dealing with um, HUD, you know, Housing and Urban Development, who's the agency responsible for administering the community development block grant process, which is intended to be really a conversation with communities about the types of infrastructure projects and how to rebuild out those types of projects in their communities in a way that's gonna create sustainability. And yet what we've seen is public hearings with no meaningful citizen participation, barely listening to some of the, the, um, alcalde, the uh, mayors from uh, these towns and where community members who go for the very few community forums that actually took place and you ha would have one community forum for 20 municipalities for one day were placed at the very end of the list, right? So community driven vision for what sustainability looks like is being deprioritized all around. In terms of what we've seen as a legal response to, to um, start begin to wrap up. What we've seen is um, obviously tremendous uh, government abuse and neglect that has not gone unnoticed by the world. You know, we have wrapped ourselves up in one legal fiction after another, the legal fiction of the free associated state, the legal fiction of Fofina, the legal fiction of the debt, right? And what we've seen is really first the international community saying, actually what we see is something very different. Um, that includes all of the various human rights mechanisms, right? Within the UN system, the independent experts, which are called special rapporteurs that hold different mandates on themes, they're part of the, the, mechanism, the human rights mechanisms within the UN, have um, unanimously, those that have expressed, weighed in on what's happening in Puerto Rico, have unanimously condemned the actions of the United States government primarily, but also any complicity with the government of Puerto Rico in not prioritizing human rights and in continuing to impose failed policies de that derive from austerity that continue to undermine actual progress and a rights-based approach to development and to adjust recovery. That includes the Special Rapporteur on Foreign um, Debt and Human Rights, the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty that visited the United States and chose to include Puerto Rico among its official visit and issued very strong recommendations to the United States, as well as the Special Rapporteur on Housing. It also includes um, the regional human rights mechanism, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which has held three thematic hearings, three years in a row on Puerto Rico, and has agreed to accept two more this coming year. That's pretty unprecedented, right? That's the commission recognizing that there is a vast and deep human rights crisis that's taking place in Puerto Rico that's been exacerbated as a result of the hurricane, but that the inequalities are structural. The inequalities and the the, the rights violations do not stem from the natural or unnatural disaster that the hurricane was. Uh, they stem from official policies that continue to prioritize um, external interests above um, those of the people. And then of course, domestically we've seen, um, you know, out of the courts, a couple of interesting opinions from the District Court in Puerto Rico, including in some of these state cases on civil rights issues. Uh, recognizing that the the impact that um, Promesa is having and stifling um, the assertion of uh, of rights, you know, and making it difficult for people to assert their rights in the face of um, of Promesa and an austerity regime. Now that we have a different um, house in Congress, I expect that we're going to see far more uh, congressional oversight. Um, there's an there's an appetite for that I think coming out of the house with some of the committees that have uh, oversight over Puerto Rico and the board that includes pushing for financial disclosures of investors. It was encouraging to hear uh, Judge Gonzalez mention that he is in favor of more disclosures. I think that's a position that people in Puerto Rico have been pushing for a very long time, including financial disclosures of members of the board, which has been a challenge to get. Uh, I think Congress will probably um, continue to push FEMA on its actions and inactions in Puerto Rico, and we'll he see more hearings related to that, uh, possibly amendments to PROMESA to deal with some of the issues that you've heard of today. And of course, there's already been a request 
to the investigator general's office and to um, the, the potential withholding of disaster relief funds that were designated for Puerto Rico to build Trump's southern border wall. Uh, so we are far from, this is far from over. Unfortunately, as I think I mentioned, um, esto va para largo. Right? This is this is uh, this is a crisis that is um, was in many ways manufactured, but is now with us for a while. And um, the responses to it, I think, and where some of the most innovative, comprehensive, hopeful responses are actually coming from the people of Puerto Rico who um, we're not listening to enough, but who are very clear about what a sustainable and just recovery uh, can look like. Thank you. Thank you. Natasha, thank you very much. Um, thank you to all our panelists for uh, the presentations that were not only informative, but obviously very deeply thought out. Uh, and. Uh, Many questions arise. I have uh, papers and papers here <laughs> of questions that I would like to put before, before uh, the panelists. I would just like to ask a few and then we'll open the, the floor. Uh, I would like to ask so many questions of, of Judge Gonzalez. Uh, <laughs> but I, 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 I think I'm going to begin just by asking what he thinks of, the, uh, of what Natasha has has said that, in a sense, that PROMESA is essentially a creditor's law, a law for creditors. What are your thoughts on that, Judge? Well, PROMESA <coughs> incorporates, if you ask creditors, I don't think they give you that answer. Uh, <coughs> PROMESA has incorporated much of, in terms of the insolvency aspects of it, come out of the bankruptcy code, which generally is viewed as an uh, chapter 11 aspects of it as a method to restructure the debt and keep the the debtor moving in a positive direction after the restructuring so I'm not quite sure why it would be considered a creditor's law because absent when you come back to the mainland there is no form of promessa that's available to the states under the bankruptcy code, you have chapter nine that's available to municipalities, but not to states. So this restructuring process that was developed in PROMESA was n unique in a sense that it, it not only allowed what states could do with their municipalities, restructure the debt through chapter nine, it allowed the Commonwealth itself to restructure the debt. So I'm not quite, I mean, certainly many people can disagree with judgments we made and, you know, openness, any number of things. I'm not here to defend everything or just try to convince someone that they shouldn't be uh, concerned or raise issues. But I, I just don't see how PROMESA is viewed as a creditor protection vehicle. What do you have to say about that, Alvin? Um, you know, I, I think I want to push back a little bit. I think if you look at PROMESA's section regarding creditor recoveries, it talks about how the the, the test for Judge Swain to apply uh, to whether, you know, to confirm a, a plan of adjustment at the end of the case, and, it, and I'm, I'm not speaking, I, let me just start with the disclaimer that I, I'm learning bankruptcy law as I go here. The biggest lesson I learned from all this as, as a union lawyer is I wish I had taken Professor Warren's uh, bankruptcy class when I was back at HLS um, because I, it would have been good to, to, to learn that and, and I think uh, would have been allowed, allowed me to do more effective advocacy during the PROMESA phase. Here's why. There's a lot of, I think, subtle language changes in PROMESA that um, have a major impact. One of them is that in order to confirm a plan of adjustment, the, um, the judge has to determine what creditor remedies are under state law versus just what's in the general best interest of creditors. The reason that language is in there in PROMESA is because there's certain bondholder groups who thought that, look, my, you know, you have the general obligation bondholder saying we're owed everything per the Constitution and, you know, we can't be impaired. And then you have COFINA saying, 
we have a structured secured debt that's bankruptcy remote, right? So you have two claims that go like this. And so obviously that language is not in there, at least in my opinion, unless somebody wanted a, a higher recovery. This was done by a, 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 a uh, what's it called, a, a Republican Congress at the time, right? In negotiation with the Democratic House, I mean presidency, excuse me. The, the, the other standard to me looks like something that if, if we had imported simply Title IX into the process, then um, Chapter Nine, then I think it would, I would have I would have had a different answer to 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 that assertion. I think the other thing that's really interesting too about Promesa is it gives the board uh, unfettered um, discretion to one issue uh, fiscal plans, and I know that's that's been subject to litigation, but also it gives them the the f sole f ability to render a plan of adjustment. So you're saying, Alvin, that's really technical. Why why should I care about that? Well, usually in bankruptcy, it, it, there's an 18-month period of exclusivity. Then after that 18-month period, other parties, other people, other proponents can uh, pro-offer a plan of adjustment. Obviously, there was a political calculation made in the drafting of PROMESA that it would be better to keep this in, in the hands of, 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 of the oversight board in order to ensure the best recoveries possible. That, that's at least my reading of the law. And, and uh, at least uh, from your point of view or, or, for, or from your principal uh, uh, point mm -hmm. about the debt, the need to audit the debt, do you think uh, PROMESA is essentially a creditor's law? I, I tend to agree with the claim and I'll, I'll, speak, um, 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 I'll speak from a constitutional and a political um, um, point and, and so, so in a typical in a, in a typical bankruptcy case, the debtor is 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 represented. The, the debtor, that the person that's going to experiment the consequences of everything that's going to happen in that proceeding, is present in in, in that case. Um, but but these Title III proceedings, um, just as as the bankruptcy proceedings um, for the city of Detroit, are sui generis in that the people that are representing. The government of Puerto Rico, um, be it the Fiscal Control Board, be it the government of Puerto Rico representatives, are dealing with other people's money. So, so the true debtor, the people of Puerto Rico, is not represented in that courtroom. And and in that sense, and in that sense, um, um, utilizing using the 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 the, the, the bankruptcy proceeding structure, um, has the effect of excluding the citizenship of Puerto Rico, excluding the people that are going to have to bear the consequences of, of these decisions. And, and in that sense, um, the legitimacy of that proceeding can be questioned in, in that regard. Very well. Uh, I have like a million questions, but I can also ask the panelists later. Let's open the floor and let's try to, in an orderly manner, you know, for a little while, because it's kind of late. Like uh, there's yeah, there's a microphone somewhere over here, or maybe we can hear you. I don't know. Uh, the gentleman right in the second, yeah, you you have been very anxious <laughs> for a long time. Thank you, uh, Josh Gonzalez. 
I, I'm looking for this section, but there was, uh, with respect to all th the three items you mentioned, I'm not 100% sure about the 936 companies, but my recollection is that we have supported the Medicaid issue. We have supported, and what was the second one you mentioned, Carlos? The Appeal of the Jones Act. Both of those, I know, also came out of a joint commission that was set up on us in Congress. And those, rec I believe, at least two of them, and maybe all three of them, are in that, and we supported those recommendations. I, I, I think you wanted uh, Alvin to address this question also. Uh, so first of all, with regard to Medicaid equality for Puerto Rico, SCIU has advocated very strongly in the halls of Congress, in the streets, and anywhere else anybody will listen to us on that issue. I mean, that, that goes to a, a basic issue of, hey, can we keep the doctors here? Like, like come on. Like, uh, I mean, honestly, my, my cousin, a couple other family members talk about how, how terrible it is to, to try to get doctors in NPR. It, it's not fun. The, the other thing, though, with regards to um, Section 936 and, and its effect is that it kind of creates this artificial fact, right? If, if the way I look at Puerto Rico right now is we can, we can talk about, like, federal intervention or what policies, but the reality is... It's, it's sometimes it, it's like a stinky diaper. Nobody wants to deal with it and make these kind of choices that really need to be made, right? And so the, the reality is, in terms of, of economic policy, I think you're right. The, the, the reality is that we, we have to figure out how to get that engine going. Some of that, invent, in, that, that, that engine happens at the local level with, with you know, solid university education, solid investment in the, in the educational system and in work programs. And then from the congressional point of view, I, I personally I tend not to think about it because I tend to look at, say, this is where we're at. What are the tools that are at my disposal right now, right? And for example, with the oversight board, the tools at their disposal is hacking and slashing at the debt, right? Or that they, they, can, they can do that, and Judge Swain has the power to do that as well. The reason that's important and tied to economic growth is if you actually look at the debt restructuring of Ecuador, for example. Ecuador took a massive haircut against a lot of its bonds and was able to immediately see economic growth. My hope, obviously, that would also assume sane administration of public use of public funds. That's, that's a whole other question. But the evidence is there that debt reduction does lead to real GDP, GNP growth, right? And I think it's important to note that what Puerto Rico needs more of is more GNP growth versus GDP growth, right? Because right now the difference is 30%. In other words, for every $100 that's created, the GNP, the gross national product, only is at 70, 70 billion of that versus 100 billion. And you're like, well, Alvin, why are you throwing out these numbers? Who, who cares? Well, 100 is how much the entire thing produces. 70 is about how much actually stays around. And again, it's that money that grows national product money, especially in Puerto Rico's case compared to other places, um, that create that, that impact, that economic impact, you, you, you need to get this thing going again. Oh. Thank you very much. We want to move on and give an opportunity to other people. Uh, here in the front row, we had a show of hands. I had, a few I had a few questions. Uh, number one, how much of the debt is actually principal versus interest? Uh, number two, does the fiscal board consider Puerto Rico's ability to pay the debt while also keeping its infrastructure, education, and healthcare system intact? Three, does Gobre and Kim uh, plan on making the documents complied, compiled from agencies and other sources uh, ever to be available to the public? Court documents show that a key portion will be kept confidential and will not be placed in a so-called document uh, depository. Okay, those three questions? Two more. 
Oh, then it's five um, questions. Let's sorry. Get, let's, and we have to give Judge sorry, sorry. Um, Gonzalez yeah. a, an opportunity maybe to answer the first the first. Let me, I, I'm going to need you to repeat the second one. But the first one, principal versus interest, my understanding would be that the amount that's reflected is probably, you know, int principal plus whatever past due interest there is. Um, so I think primarily you're looking at principal numbers, I'm pretty sure, but I, I, I really would have to check that. Uh, in terms of the Kobe and Kim, Kobe and Kim's investigation involved requesting information, and rather than engage in a constant battle about whether or not you had a, a party had to disclose the information, sometimes the information was given under um, a blanket of confidentiality, but it, and it's listed that way, but it doesn't mean you can't access it. What it means, um, there are procedures in which an entity or person can go to court and seek the information. All Kobe and Kim did was took whatever information that it had under the promise of confidentiality and to maintain that promise, and the court approved that procedure such that if someone wanted access to the information, they would have to go to court to get it. Uh, thank you. You have uh, just one more thing. I um, I actually am a Hurricane Maria survivor. Um, I had to come back here. My mother's back here. A lot of my family's back here. If everyone leaves Puerto Rico, what are your contingency plans to get this debt paid off? Okay. Thank you. Well, you know, we will have to do a plan, and the plan will have to be based on a fiscal plan, and the fiscal plan will have to be based on projections of, of income revenues throughout the Commonwealth. And to the extent those revenues don't go beyond covering the basic services, under those circumstances, there wouldn't be anything left over. Um, yes, please. possibly its own country. I'm wondering what you think. Uh, Who wants to address that question? I, I'll tell you what, I've got a pat answer for that. Okay. Okay. So, so actually, there is no easy answer. Okay. Duh. Why, why is there no easy answer? I, I tend to look at this with, with all due respect for the, the, the citizens from Puerto Rico who fought in our army. I tend to look at this as an economic issue. If Puerto Rico becomes independent, it's like playing Russian roulette. What do I mean by that? You have the highest gain to have because then you can set your own monetary policy. You can you know, deflate your debt against, you can go to the IMF, you can enter the IMF program. But that's like saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to Hollywood with the guitar on my back, sing away, and I'm gonna become a star. In other words, if you make it big, it's great. If you can't make it big, you got a problem, right? Or in my case, I can sing baritone, but I can't sing alto. I mean, it, it's it, it's kind of one of those. It's it's a one it's a one trick shot, and you can get it right. With statehood, the issue with statehood is that the it's kind of like having a Rolls Royce with no gas, right? You can say, hey, we are getting statehood, we're getting all these benefits of being a state, but there's a, there's a real problem with it economically. Puerto Ricans are taxed at the federal tax levels, more or less, okay? So let's suppose Puerto Ricans can't afford the government they have now, which people will say, well, the government of Puerto Rico is oversized. Actually, no, it's not. If you take the numbers of Puerto Ricans take, divided by the population, guess what? It ranks with Wyoming. This is number 37 on the scale. Wyoming, nobody talks about Wyoming as being a huge state with a huge, a huge government apparatus. It's a Republican stronghold, it's all. If you get a, a, if Puerto Rico becomes a state, then you have Puerto Rico paying 80%, Puerto Ricans as the top marginal rate in taxes. Who wants to move to an 80% jurisdiction, state jurisdiction? Exactly, nobody's hands are going up, right? It, it, it creates another problem. If you keep the current status though, you keep the current rot. In other words, there's no easy solutions. I, I think to, to talk about the status debate right now is a bit like 
looking at a red herring. The real issue is the debt. The real issue is the economy. The real issue is you ain't got no gas for this engine. Let's get some gas for the engine first. I'm gonna just briefly add to that. I actually disagree. I think it's always a good time to talk about the status issue. Um, I, I think that if you ask people in Puerto Rico how beneficial their relationship with the United States has been, they say we're in the worst economic depression of our island's history, at least in the last decade, and that the relationship with the U.S. has not proved to provide any economic stability. It's uh, driven policies of forced migration in a way that we now see the majority of Puerto Ricans living outside of the island and can't s live sustainable lives on the island, and that there's been a history of an extractive economy that's been based on the exploitation and extraction of land and resources and talent from the island that hasn't produced uh, a relationship that's been mutually beneficial. Um, that being said, international law is also very clear about what a process of decolonization looks like. The results of that process is up to the people of Puerto Rico to decide, but recognizing that Puerto Rico continues to be reviewed every year by the UN Decolonization Committee, even though it was removed from the list of non-self-governing territories because of the constitution that was created, it continues to call for a full process of decolonization, right? I think that if Puerto Rico had uh, more autonomy over its economic vision um, and could look at trade differently, could look at um, you know access to different markets, to different creditors, including regional mechanisms with much more favorable rates um, and terms for them, that we could, we, we'd have an, an alternate economic vision for what was possible. Thank you. We've had, uh, we've had two visions of a, of, of an answer to that question. Let's move on to another one. Yes, please. One of the first recommendations that the board um, produced before Hurricane Maria uh, was these budget cuts on the University of Puerto Rico. Now, um, those cuts are frustrating for any number of reasons, um, starting with the fact that they're draconian and will have um, uh, terrible, terrible repercussions. But one of the most frustrating aspects of this first set of recommendations was that they didn't seem to have any rational, like um, at least not one that was communicated to the press and the general public. Nobody really knows what the board was thinking when they produced this recommendation of cutting um, half the UPR's budget. So I would very much like to know what was in the board's mind, what, what those conversations looked like in terms of why the university should be you know, targeted first and why so hard? Well, I can tell you what we based it on, at least some of it. <clears throat> I, can't, I can't be sure that I'll have it all down. But first of all, we compared it with public universities in, in mainland. The funding of the public universities in the mainland is uh, 20, 30 percent underwritten by the state on average. UPR is 70 percent funded by the Commonwealth. There's one comparison. <clears throat> also, the tuition was, relatively speaking, was substantially lower than the states. Even in the most recent fiscal plan, the maximum annual tuition and fiscal year 23 is $5,090, still below the federal Pell, Pell Grant, so we were cognizant of that, far less than a public uh, university on the mainland, which is tuition average of $10,200. We had to look at it as something that is just too costly to maintain at that level. And in terms of for the students or the uh, applicants who would have difficulty and need additional financial aid, we did create in the last fiscal plan a $35 million additional scholarship to help, and we increased that by 11 percent over the previous year. So there were efforts made to address those issues, and I, I think if you see numbers like that, the one reaction I would have would be internally there needs to be something done. 
because things are being uh, produced or used or, or, or cost at a far, far higher rate than one would imagine they should be. And so it's that analysis we did based on those statistics that we had in order to make the recommendations. Thank you. Uh, wait, wait, wait one minute, please. I think that we're going to have a, a chance to do that later on. Puerto Rico's tuition, the tuition at the UPR. Um, it's actually, <laughs> if you take into account per capita income and the general cost of attendance, actually the University of Puerto Rico is not the cheapest university in the, in the US. It's actually number 32 or so. So that kind of math has to be based on real research. And there are real researchers available on the island doing this kind of work. So I wonder why the board doesn't avail itself from the services of these people who know what they're doing and could provide decent advice. And, and, My, also and I'm going back a couple of months, but I believe when the fiscal plan was, was adopted, there were people from the university who spoke. And I, I can't sit here and tell you I remember everything that was said, but I'm not sure when we put these numbers in the fiscal plan why it wasn't responded to then. I may be wrong. It may well have been. Uh, to answer you to your question, I think that is what it was based on. Thank you, Judge Gonzalez. Uh, we'll go to this gentleman here who has been asking for an opportunity for a while. And then we'll take one or two more questions, and I think we can finish, wrap it up, and you'll have a chance to talk to all the panelists later on. Thank you. My question is primarily addressed to Alvin, but also the other members of the panel, other than Judge Gonzalez. You had mentioned <laughs> that- Judge Gonzalez arrest. <laughs> <laughs> you had mentioned that one of the differences between this proceeding and a bankruptcy is that there's no uh, exclusivity period over here where other uh, constituents can propose a plan. If you were to propose a plan, what would that plan look like, generally? So I think you, you heard me talk about the, the need for a substantial haircut to the face value of the outstanding debt. I think that's the first place we would have to start. Secondly is, you know, obviously we would have to look also at investment in educational resources and educational outcome. Obviously, there's been some efficiency issues, so we'd have to look at a fiscal plan that, that addresses that. And then with regards to the, the, the pensions on, on island, we would have to keep those, I would say, pretty close to where, where we are right now. And the only reason is because the fact of the matter is the, the, the system, it, it, it kind of collapses on itself the more you take money out of high consumers. Could you do me a favor, though, and tell me what specifically you want me to address? Because obviously, it seems like I, I, can, I can talk about a billion different things. Funding. I, I like to talk. Funding, funding the plan. Funding the plan. Well, again, so if you look at the General Fund of Puerto Rico, the General Fund of Puerto Rico typically has gone 9 to $10 billion a year based on an audited basis, OK? Let's go on to 2014. Current fiscal plan, if I recall correctly, and the letter that was recently put out by the board puts it at eight, at $8 billion. In terms of funding the plan, $2 billion a year goes out to debt and debt financing, and that's just primarily from the general fund and general fund sources. That alone covers all the pay-go easily and keeps your government operations in your steady state. Again. But I'm gonna, I, what I will concede is you can't cut your way to success on either, either side. Okay. It doesn't look like I answered your question, but <laughs> it, I'm. You did, it was a, it was a very, very general, broad yeah. question. So okay. I appreciate it, thank you. Okay, we'll take one more question, one more question. Yes, yes sir, you. And, uh, and then we'll ask Rick to come up and 
Then we'll adjourn and then we'll have a million more questions. Can it be three questions? Uh, <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. Do we have lawyers in the house? <laughs> well, um, the first one is um, uh, from the gentleman in the front. He, he, uh, he mentioned the, about the possible fiscal plan and, and you said that um, it would be up to the government and for you guys to come up with a fiscal plan. But that just made me think, shouldn't you have a viable fiscal plan first prior to going into negotiations, especially when there has been, and the name is <coughs> Joseph Stingley, this was on a Bloomberg report that stated that the current um, negotiations will potentially take the island back into bankruptcy and it's not uh, well, Let me answer that first. My, my response was, if everyone left the island, what would you do? We'd have to do a new, we do have a fiscal plan, and it's upon that fiscal plan we're negotiating now. The hypothetical was is if everyone leaves the island, what do you do then? That's why I said you'd have to do a fiscal plan reflecting the current status of things. Okay, so, so I guess then, then uh, it would be changed to the fact that um, how, what considerations have been taken of these economists, especially one such as Stingley, um, in, in as far as creating that fiscal plan, if any? We have the, the people that work for us, you know, examine the economy, examine, the, you know, the records of the revenues, projections, et cetera, and the economists make judgments. And some people think we're overly optimistic, and others think we're too pessimistic. Okay. Um, the, the other one was um, Elliott Management um, was um, represented in the earlier trials in January um, 16th. Um, I saw a couple of articles from them, and they also were apparently in the center of uh, the Argent Argentina debt crisis. Um, oh. One of their articles in January of 2018 said, Junior bonds will potentially um, give a return of a thousand percent. Around June, they w wrote another article saying uh, the junior Cofina bonds will have a 400% uh, potential gain. What do you think as far as the bondholders, owners, original owners versus those who own the bonds after the actual um, bankruptcy proceedings occur? Should there be a distinction in the way that they've been treated? I, I've done, I've been doing this for probably nearly 30 years. You do, you know, I understand the complaint. Someone buys the bond uh, at 20 cents on a dollar, get a recovery of 60 cents on a dollar, and you say, how can that be? Essentially, that's what the law is. You're allowed a claim in the face amount of the debt. Now, unless you act in some improper way during the bankruptcy that may push you to the back of the line for some kind of conduct, at the end of the day, the same person who made the $100 loan and the person standing next to them who may have spent 10 cents on a dollar for another $100 claim, both have the same rights under the U.S. Bankruptcy Code to collect based on a $100 amount for each. Both have the same voting rights. That is the law that exists. Whether I personally like it or not, or think there should be some adjustment to it, there's really nothing that can be done about it. Judge Swain, in my opinion, I mean, she can make whatever judgment she thinks is appropriate. I don't believe that she could sit there and say, these people bought it at a discount, therefore they get less. These people are the original holders, therefore they get more. I don't really believe as a legal matter you could do it. As an equitable matter, matter you may well want to do it and say this just isn't fair. But at the end of the day, I think the law would dictate the outcome of that. Uh, thank you, um, Judge. Well, well, that, that, that led well, me to my you. last question, actually. Okay, well, that I'm was sorry. Uh, so so Brian Rosen rhetorically um, took a stance which seemed mostly protecting the primary bondholders um, as opposed to how the deal was different from the junior bondholders, um, <coughs> noting that, or, or I should note, that the primary bondholders actually hold less risk in the overall equation mm -hmm. 
Um, so there, there was actually two things he, he took a stance on. One was the the deal to the, which I consider a generous deal to the primary bondholders. And secondly, that the, the matter of fact or the issue of whether the Commonwealth can or cannot pay for the current negotiation was not uh, part of the proceedings. Uh, so one is, well, I'll, I'll try to cut the other one. I think I, I kind of let it let it there. As a previous judge, do you would you agree that the fact of Puerto Rico being able to feasibly pay or not pay should be or should not be part of the proceedings? That that issue, I wrote an article about an editorial about, and basically took the same position then that the judge took now. It was a legal issue as to whether or not the COFINA bondholders had a security interest in the sales tax. Purely legal issue. Whether the Commonwealth needed the money or didn't need the money was irrelevant to the legal determination. Were they entitled to a lien on the sales tax? And the reason I was in favor of the settlement and the board was in favor as well, because the risk was substantial. Arguments about the equitable aspects of the Commonwealth needs the money, it's, it's, you, you just can't let this happen. I don't know how it would have influenced Judge Swain, but I'm very confident that ultimately if, it, if she ruled in an equitable way to say the, the, the um, you know, the Commonwealth needs the money, therefore I'm going to rule against COFINA, I am quite confident that would be reversed. I mean, if you look at it as a bank with a mortgage and someone really needs the house and they're not paying the mortgage, a judge is not going to be able to say to the bank, you don't need the money, the homeowner needs, it more, needs the house more than you need the money and make an equitable decision. The laws are not, equity plays out in the law but not in that area. And with COFINA, the risk was enormous. Alvin doesn't agree with me, I think, in the, in the analysis of the, of the risk. I appreciate that. Alvin, Alvin wants to say something about this. <laughs> <laughs> he is almost jumping out of his seat. Excuse me. Okay. We don't have to. Well, let's, let's give Alvin a chance before he jumps. <laughs> oh, he won't jump. Maybe. Okay. Um, look, I, I think there's 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 two things here to play out, right? First of all, I think Judge Judge Gonzalez rightly talks about trading patterns. Like people trade, they play Russian. You know, they they they're they're they're, they're trying to buy low to get to, to earn high. The fact that trading happens is completely unremarkable. It, it, it just is. However, when it comes to the, to the law, I think what you're going to see, and I'm, I'm hoping that Judge Swain will have this play out, is that when you're talking about a Chapter 9 debtor or a government entity debtor, you have to keep it running. You have to keep it moving. And so what does that mean? I think there's been a lot of focus on financial creditors, on bondholders. But, you know, for example, the general obligation bondholders hold 16 billion, COFINA anywhere between 16 and 17 billion, depending how you calculate that. Active retiree claims, like of workers who are working right now, is around 15 to 16 billion, billion as well. And there's a huge difference. When you're a bondholder, you are taking a risk. It could be a minimalized risk, but it's a risk. When you're a worker, you don't take that risk. You take the, the, the salary as a trade-off from the risk that is involved with, a, with, with, a, with either an equity or a fixed income instrument. So in other words, I think what the way I would postulate this, and I, I can see this going forward, is you have two sets of strong legal claims, right? So you have the workers and you have the financial creditors, especially in a chapter nine. I think there is a legal basis for, for a more equitable treatment. How that's gonna play out, who knows? But that's, that's, I think, the central question, and I think that's what has ultimately brought us all here together to talk about this very fascinating topic. Thank you. Well, let's uh, have uh, Rick formally adjourn. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. I have a feeling that this Q&A can go on for hours if everyone who had their hand up has between three and five questions. <laughs> um, uh, 
so my name is Rick Antonoff, and together with uh, Natasha, I co-chair the New York City Bar Association's Puerto Rico Task Force. Um, and on behalf of the task force, I first of all thank all of you for trudging through this, the slush to be here. Um, I want to also thank Roger Maldonado for his uh, leadership and his support for the work that we do on the task force. Uh, I want to thank this wonderful panel. Um, I, we would not have been able to bring you this program without the generous contribution of our sponsors, uh, who I'll name Ancora, Ask LLP, Beacon Hill Legal, Blank Rome, Gol Golenbach Eisman, King and Spaulding, Latham and Watkins, the Law Office of Wanda Sanchez Day, and Frank Torres Esquire. Uh, I do hope that you'll join us for a reception. We have hors d'oeuvres and, uh, and beverages coming. And um, just once again, please join me in thanking this wonderful panel.